सो हेलो टू ऑल माई डियर एक्सपीरियंस वेलकम यू टू सेल टू एम डी एस डेंटल अकेडमी आई एम डॉक्टर मलय त्रिवेदी एम पीडियाडिक डेंटिस्ट एंड असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इन कॉलेज ऑफ डेंटल साइंसिस सो फ्रेंड टूडे वी आर हियर विद द इमेज बेस्ड लेक्चर सो मोस्टली वी आर गोइंग टू कवर द सब्जेक्ट्स विच वी हैव डेल्ट इन दिस मंथ लाइक योर डेंटल एनाटॉमी हिस्टोलॉजी एंड जनरल पैथोलॉजी एंड ब्रोडोंटिक्स विच आर विच वी आर गोइंग टू कवर इन द कमिंग वीक so let's get started with the lecture so before starting with the lecture want to tell you few points regarding your preparation see experience in this your neat mds or you take aims or pj whatever exam you want to clear or you want to get through it along with your study the preparation guidelines is very important it is almost equally important see if you are studying properly but if you are not going in right direction it is of no use so right direction is very important so today we are going to talk about the guidance in your preparation so i want to talk about two important points the first point is which type of guidance you are taking are you taking the guidance from the person who is well acquainted with the present exam pattern or who knows that which thing has to be done properly to prepare the students because i have seen many you know people are uh, telling some wrong things even you might have heard from your seniors or from your college people like they are saying that just read your pulse and gauri shankar is more than enough some people are telling that for medicine and pharmacology don't read just read mudit khanna and amita shizer is more than enough but dear students it is completely wrong if you see last two years paper they are eye opener the repeats from your dental pulse gauri shankar from your past papers from your mudit khanna amita shizer is hardly 5 to 7 questions all other questions are newly prepared so the key in your preparation should be your concept you should read and you should focus properly and those who are telling that pulse is more than enough for reading just mudit khanna amita shri is more than enough it is right for 2015 not for 2020 2021 okay so please study properly second thing regarding guidance is that i have seen the students are taking guidance from multiple people i am not forcing that you take guidance from me only but from whom you are taking guidance you should follow him or her properly because if you take the guidance of around 5 to 7 people at the end you will get confused bhai karna kya hai if somebody is telling they are reading this way some uh, people will tell read this book that book so at the end you will get confused so don't take guidance of multiple people otherwise mixtures will be there in your mind rather take the guidance of one or two people and plan your preparation okay aspirants so please focus on the guidance and take right updated guidance so let's start with our lecture so we'll talk first image based question that is about the enamel and cementum meeting so most often we know that enamel overlap cementum there is edge to it there is a butt joint and around few 5 to 10% we have enamel and cementum do not meet so this question is repeatedly asked in your examination so you have to remember that percentage that enamel overlap cementum in around 60 to 65% edge to edge is 30% and enamel and cementum don't meet is around 5 to 10% so please aspirants remember this diagram now let's talk about your cuspal pattern so we have four type of cuspal pattern so this is the upper indicates your upper arch and lower indicates your lower arch so this pattern indicates the haplodont this is your triconodont pattern this is your tri tubercular molar pattern and this is your quadri tubercular molar pattern so experience in exam they can give you any of this diagram and and they tell you what is the cuspal pattern so you should know then let's talk about the internal features of your tmj so first of all let us understand in very simple manner so let us take the coronal section so in coronal section you are seeing uh, this is your condyle and this is your mandibular fossa so <clears throat> you can see first we'll talk about this articular disc so remember this articular disc now we'll go here it is divided into three area anterior middle and the posterior remember your middle area is very thin whereas the anterior and posterior area are thick and remember this articular disc or you can tell it as meniscus also it is non innervated and non muscularized 
and posteriorly it is continuous with the bilaminar zone. Remember this bilaminar zone is vascularized but this area is non-vascularized. And this disc divide your TMJ space into two area. This is your superior compartment aspirant. Remember this is your superior compartment and this is your inferior compartment. Fine. Then you can see this synovium which lubricates your joint. Then you can <coughs> see this uh, articular surface. Then this is your condylar area. So this is your basic TMJ anatomy. And remember your TMJ is a synovial kind of diarthroidal joint. It has both kind of movement. It has a slide, gliding movement also and it has sliding movement also. And normally if you see other diarthroidal joint in the body, they are covered by the hyaline cartilage but your TMJ is covered by the fibrocartilage. Fine, so these are few important points regarding your TMJ. And remember the muscle associated with the TMJ is your lateral pterygoid. So in exam, if any of the question asks in the tell you label, please focus on the diagram. You can easily label them. And one more important point, remember that we have the ligaments associated with the TMJ which stabilize your TMJ. So whenever there is a TMJ disc displacement is there, it means there is problem in your ligament. Now we'll talk about few questions related to PDL. So what this indicates as PDL? This indicates your gingival crevices. What is this area? It is your PDL area. Now let's see them in more detail. So as far as we can say, this is your gingival sulcus. This is your gingival margin. Till free gingival groove, it is your free gingiva. And from free gingival groove to your mucogingival junction, you can say this is your attached gingiva. And after that, you can see your alveolar mucosa. This is your alveolar bone. And always remember, adjacent to your alveolar bone, we have PDL and its fibers. And this is your cementum area. Now, few points. Remember, the thickness of the PDL will vary from root to root. The thinnest portion of the PDL is in the middle of the root. And third, the width of the PDL will decrease with age. And the most important thing you have to remember about PDL is that it is always in a state of remodeling. So, for example, your tooth is in hyperfunction or hyperfunction, the PDL fibers will change itself. Okay. Now let's talk about this few radiograph. What it indicates? So what is this aspirin? This is your trestle plate. Fine. So whenever there is a vertical bone loss or horizontal bone loss, we can see the resorption of this plate. Then what this radiopic line indicates? It indicates the floor of your maxillary sinus. Remember, the most closely associated tooth is your maxillary first molar. Then we come to the morphology of teeth. Almost in my lectures, I have given you 50 important points regarding morphology of primary and permanent teeth and that take cover almost all the question. So to add to that, I have decided that you should able to know the more intricate detail regarding this morphology. So in this lecture, I'm just telling you the key points that how to differentiate. Then I will share on the group the slides related to each and every tooth. So that will be helpful to you. And those students who are not part of my uh, lecture uh, lecture series, they can just WhatsApp me. I will uh, mail you. So when you see any question regarding the identification of tooth, ask yourself five questions. First is category. Second, whether it is a permanent or deciduous. Whether it is in the upper or lower arch. Where is the location? Anterior or posterior or left or right. So in this five categories, I had divided all the tooth like incisors, your canines, your premolars and molars. So it will be very easy for you. We'll share with you so you can go through it. So just one point regarding permanent deciduous trees. Remember the deciduous trees have thinner enamel. They have the bulbous crown and the roots are very thinner and shorter. Okay, in particular the deciduous molar roots are more diverging. Now friends, we'll talk about few pediatric dentistry point. So this is your BOMS classification. That is your primary molar classification. Remember, it depends upon your distal surface of second molar. So in this is your distal step terminal plane. So what it indicates? Whenever the distal surface of your second molar is distal to the distal surface of the upper molar, it is distal step terminal plane. And when it is mesial to the distal surface of the upper second molar, it is known as mesial step terminal plane. And when it is in line, it is known as flush terminal plane. 
So now we'll talk about this Scammon growth curve. What it means? It says that different tissues in the body grow at different times and at different rate. So let's compare different tissues. So lymphoid tissue, if you say, they grow around 100% around 7 years of age. It, its growth reach around 200% around 10 to 11 years of age. After that, it involutes. It decreases in size and reach the normal percent around 20 years. Then you take the example of the genital uh, tissues. The growth is very slow till around 13 to 14 age and after puberty it peaks or we can say it increases in growth. Then if you take the journal body or we can say the somatic tissues they follow as shaped growth curve. It means uh, initially they will increase after that there is a dip in the growth and again they will increase. Then if you see the neural tissues they reach around 99% around 7 years of age after that they have the stagnant growth. So remember your maxilla followed the neural growth curve whereas your mandible followed the journal tissues, somatic tissues that is S shaped growth curve. Very important MCQ. Now let's talk about the nullar stage. Very important. So stage 0 indicate the absence of crypt. Stage 1 presence of crypt. Stage 2 initial calcification. Stage 3 you can see one third of crown completed. Stage 4 two thirds of crown completed. Stage 5, you can see crown almost completed. Why I am telling you state by state? Because in exam, they can put this diagram and they can ask you it, it belongs to which stage. Then you have to say that yes, it belongs to the fourth stage, that is two third crown completed. So, fifth, you can say crown almost completed. Here you can see the crown completed. Remember, whenever the follicle is there, you can say crown is completed. Here, one third of root completed. Here you can say two third of root completed. So, remember your Tooth eruption begins at stage 6 and tooth will erupt around stage 8. Stage 9 you can say the root almost completed you can see open apex and stage 10 apical end of root is completed. So this is your nulla stage of tooth development. Now one important uh, uh, classification is a Dimejan method for dental age assessment. It ranges from your stage 0 to stage H. Recently in the exam, they have asked stage D. So please follow each and everything. So stage 0 is always no sign of calcification. Stage A, you can see the beginning of calcification. In stage B, you can see the fusion of the calcification area occur. Stage C, you can see that the enamel formation is completed with the convergence toward the cervical region. And at stage C, the dentinal deposit starts. And stage D, you can see the beginning of root formation. You can see here the root is getting start to form. Stage E, the root length is less than your crown height. Stage F, here the root length is almost equal or greater to your crown height. Then in stage G, you can see the walls of the root are parallel and apical end is still open in your molars. And stage H, you can see. The apical end of distal root in molar is closed and PDL is uniform around the root and apex. So please experience remember both nullar stage and your diminution scale for your dental age assessment. So what this blue area indicate? Remember it indicates your eruption hematoma most commonly seen during your eruption of the permanent teeth. Then what is this ulceration on the ventral surface of the tongue? It is your Riga Fede disease. And why it occurs? Because of the presence of natal or the neonatal teeth. Remember in exam, if they are giving the word only Riga Fede, it means what? Ulcers on the breast of the mother because of neonatal or the natal teeth. But if Riga Fede disease is there, it is in the mouth. Then as parents, we will talk about the primate space. Very simple to remember experience. Remember in the upper arch it is mesial to your canine and in lower arch it is distal to your deciduous canine. Remember these primate spaces are also known as anthropoid or senior spaces. Then what this midline diastema you can see as experience. This is your ugly duggling stage. Remember if it is around 2 mm 
no need to uh, it will get resolved on its own no need to correct if it is more than 2 mm then you need to correct the midline dye stream and in the mixed rendition so why you can see ugly ugly stage around 9 to 11 years during the eruption of your canine it push the roots of the teeth which causes this midline diastema. So this is your ugly dugging stage. Then what are these? These are the physical race trains. So these are a papoose board and this is the paddy wrap most commonly used in pediatric dentistry for protective stabilization. Now as we will talk about the morphology of pits and fissure. So we know there are around five kinds of pit and fissure. So in exam they can ask you anyone and they will tell the importance of them. So we are following the Nagano classification who has divided the pit and fissure into five types that is the V, U, inverted Y, I and IK. So this is the experience U type of pit and fissure. Okay, the width is same from the top to bottom. This is V type. Okay, we can say wide at the top and gradually becomes narrow at the bottom. Then we have I type. It is extremely narrow slit. Remember this U and V type are self-cleansing and this I, I can inverted Y type are more prone to caries. What is this IK type? It is a narrow slit but we can see large space at the bottom. And what is this inverted Y type? Okay, you can see the width is little more than your IK type at the top and at the bottom we can say it divided into two large areas. So these are your morphology of pits and fissures. Now these are good points regarding your zones of etching. So we can see whenever you etch the surface, the enamel text will form. So at the beginning we can say edge zone that is around 10 micrometer. Then we have a qualitative porous zone which is around 20 micrometer and at the end we have quantitative porous zone which is also around 20 micrometer. Now we will talk about few appliances used during habits like this is the palatal creep. So as parents, the palatal creep are of different shape, most commonly used during thumb sucking. Fine, so these all three are the pictures for your palatal creep. Remember palatal creep is used for thumb sucking and tongue creep or tongue rake is used for the tongue thrusting habit. Now this is the blue grass appliance which is the most novel appliance, most commonly used for the thumb sucking habit. And this is your hay rake appliance. Fine, so please note the difference between your crips, it is little bit pointed and this is your rake appliance and this is your blue grass appliance which is also known as Haskell appliance. Then as friends, this is your tongue creep, most commonly used for the tongue thrusting habit. Then this is the Galela habit breaking appliance, remember this is a dual appliance. It is used to correct tongue thrusting habit also and at the same time for thumb sucking habit. Okay, so remember the shape of the Galela habit breaking appliance. Then this is the oral screen, most commonly used for the mouth breathing habit. Sometimes we have a holes in this oral screen which is known as holes modification. Then you can see as parents this diagram, this is the pickling of gingiva. Most commonly seen in case of self injurious habits. Commonly seen in syndrome like Lishman syndrome. So what to do, the children will try to injure his or her own organ and most commonly we can see such pickling of gingiva. Then this is the developmental stages of your early childhood caries. So as friends, this is your initial reversible stage. This can be treated with the help of your remineralizing agent and we can say fluoride therapy. In this damaged caries stage, it need a restoration along with your fluoride therapy and in this deep lesion, the pulpectomy is mandatory along with the crowns. You can give either strip crown or zirconia crown. Wherever the experience in this traumatic stage, if the root is there, you can go for the treatment of pulpectomy followed by post and crowns. Otherwise, you have to extract the teeth and you have to give the groper appliance. We will see in the later side that what is the groper appliance. Now experience. You know in pediatric dentistry, we have preformed crowns which are known as stainless steel crowns. So in stainless steel crown, there are two important steps and two important pliers associated with, with it. So this is your contouring pliers and this is your crimping pliers. So we do the contouring and the crimping of crown at, at the end, at the last step. Why? To have the proper gingival fit. 
to have the proper fit of the crown. So what happens? The gingival margin will be properly adapted to the crown. So that will protect your gingival tissue and also provide mechanical retention to the crown. Then we will talk about the view classification, what this classification is about. This is for the cleft leaf and cleft palate classification. So please remember A is just a defect in soft palate. This is a defect in both your soft palate and hard palate. Here the defect will involve soft palate, hard palate and you can see it involves the alveolus till the lip. Here in group 4 we can see complete bilateral clefts. So please go with this view classification. Then we have one commonly following classification nowadays that is a Karhan and stripped Y classification. So he has divided it into right and left area. Then 1 and 4 will indicate the lip. 2 and 5 will indicate your alveolus. After that the 3 and 6 will indicate the hard palate till your incisive foramen. 7 and 8 is hard palate posterior to your incisive foramen. And 9 indicates your soft palate. And remember whatever the light area is there. It is the normal tissue and the darker area is your affected tissue. So this is your Karhanan stripped Y classification. Then as friends, let's talk about few space maintainer. This is your band and loose space maintainer. Most commonly give whenever there is a unilateral loss of deciduous molar. Then you can say this is your lingual arch. Mostly we give after the eruption of your lower anteriors. And whenever there is a unilateral or bilateral loss of your deciduous molar. But remember after the eruption of permanent lower incisors only we can give lingual arch. Then this is your non-spelatal arch we give after the eruption of your permanent anterior and one more indication point that whenever there is a bilateral loss of deciduous molar we give non-spelatal arch. But when there is a unilateral loss of deciduous molar and you can see the opposite side is intact we can give Transparental arch. Now, this is a distal shoe space maintainer. Remember, as parents, we give whenever there is a loss of second deciduous molar before the eruption of the permanent molar. So, this distal shoe space maintainer acts as a guiding appliance for the eruption of your permanent molars. Now, as parents, I have talked initially about the Groper appliance. So, whenever you have condition like this, you can see all your deciduous incisors are in the traumatic stage and even the root is resolved, then what we used to do? We used to extract the teeth and we give Groper appliance. So why we need to give Groper appliance is such a small children? Because the anterior teeth have a role to play in the children. First is that they help in speech development. So whenever we speak, our lip will touch the anterior teeth for the pronunciation of particular letters. So if teeth are not there, the children may have speech problem. And second is for their aesthetics. If the anterior teeth are not there, the children may have psychological trauma. Now as friends, we will talk about few removable space maintainers. So whenever the teeth are there, it is functional and teeth are not there, it is non-functional. So it is a bilateral non-functional space maintainer, it is unilateral non-functional non space maintainer. This is unilateral, teeth is there, that's why functional space maintainer. And this is your bilateral functional space maintainer. So, aspirin, this is a western blot technique. So, in example, in exam, they can ask you any such question, like they can ask you any technique, they will give the steps of technique, and you have to identify for what purpose it is used or what is the principle behind the technique. So, let us see one technique which is known as western blot technique. Remember, this technique separates the blood protein and detects the specific protein called HIV antibodies, which indicate HIV infection. The western blot, along with the positive ELISA, they are considered with a 99.9% .9 accurate for confirming your HIV infection. So, let us see the principles behind this technique. So, what they do first, we will keep the antigen samples in the separation gel. So, what will happen? The proteins will get separated. Then these proteins are transferred in the bloating tank which contain nitrocellulose sheet. Okay? Then your antibodies are labeled, that is your HIV antibodies are labeled and they undergo immunostaining. Then you can see on autoradiography your antigen bands. So that indicates that yes, HIV is present. So this is the method or principle for your 
Western blot technique. Now, experience what this literal self indicate. You can see hair on appearance, so it indicates your thalassemia. So remember how it occurs. So in the skull, there is extreme thickening of the diploid. There is a medulla. Remember, and the inner and the outer cortical plates become poorly defined, and the trabeculae become the plates become elongated, and they produce a bristle-like crew cut or hair on appearance on the surface of skull. And because of lack of hematopoietic marrow, the occipital bone is usually not involved. So what you can see, you can see hair on appearance here only. The occipital area is not involved. Why? Because they don't have that hematopoietic red marrow. Now, as parents will see the syphilis, we see all the four stages of syphilis. So normally we have three stage, but there is latent stage also. So what is a primary syphilis? So in that we can see the chancre. It's a hallmark of primary syphilis. Most commonly, you can see 10 to 19 days after infection. Common area for chancre is penis and labia. And other side, we can see it can occur in the anus also and oral mucosa. So, without treatment, the chancre disappears in around 2 to 8 weeks. Fine. Then, secondary syphilis, we can see the rashes or macules, most commonly in the palms and soles in 50% of cases. In oral cavity, we can see the mucus patches, which look like uh, snail track ulcers. Sometimes we can see the aseptic meningitis or early neurosyphilis in second stage also. Then we can see ocular syphilis, which in involve the anterior or posterior uveitis. Then we have a genitoinguinal rashes, mostly look like a tinea or hip dub wart, which is known as condyloma lata. And sometimes in secondary syphilis, they also uh, affect internal organs, we can say acute hepatitis and nephrotic syndrome. So this is your primary and secondary syphilis. So what is latent syphilis? It is an asymptomatic stage and it is mostly seen after the period of primary and secondary syphilis. So it is early latent and late latent. So please as parents understand the difference. In early latent we can see the patient is asymptomatic with positive testing. And in late latent, we can see the positive serology is there, but they do not meet the criteria for early. So difference between the treatment is that in early latent, we used to give the single dose of penicillin, whereas in late latent, we have to give the multiple dose of penicillin. Remember the treatment for the primary syphilis is your benzathione penicillin and for secondary syphilis is your procrine penicillin. So what is about the late or tertiary penicillin? Remember it will involve your internal organs. So we can say in secondary early neurosyphilis, so here there will be late neurosyphilis, including your tapes, dorsalis, gait impairments and dementia. Fine. Sometime we can found the gamma as we have chancre here, there is a gamma, there is a ulcerating granuloma or you can say skin, bone and internal organs. We have cardiovascular effects of late syphilis like your aortic aneurysm and coronary arthritis. So, experience, please know all the four stages of your syphilis and where all the lesion is there that you should remember. Then, experience, we will talk about genetic mapping. So, what the genetic mapping means? So, what is mapping? So, for example, we see any map, we can see the state, district, so we can localize a specific thing. The same is for the genetic mapping also. So, what they do, they will show us the chromosome and they will also show the exact area where the gene is located. So let's see a few genetic mapping, which is a hot favorite question for the examiner to ask. Mostly in any exam you take, they will ask you one or the other chromosomal defect, whether in the form of image-based question or in the form of the single type answer. So as friends, what you can see here, the 21 chromosome is defective so, and one extra chromosome you can see. So it is 21 trisomy, that is your Down syndrome. What here we can see? We can see that your piece of number 5 chromosome is missing. So that is your Cryduchart syndrome, which is also known as 5P minus syndrome. We can see mostly in the infant and they have the high pitched cry like that of cat. Then there is a Klein-Feldel syndrome. So what it is? We have extra X chromosome in male. Remember it is not inherited, but it is a random genetic error after conception. So whoever male born the Klein-Fender syndrome, they have a low testosterone, they have reduced muscle mass, facial hair and body hair and they are not able to produce sperm. So what the treatment of the Klein-Fender syndrome is? 
they include testosterone replacement and fertility treatment. Remember, they have extra X chromosome. Then what is the Turner syndrome? Here the one X chromosome is missing in female. We see normally in female we have two X chromosome. Here one is missing. Okay. So what are the symptoms you can see? Short stature, delayed puberty, infertility, heart defects and certain learning disability. So treatment involves hormone therapy. And fertility therapy is required for women who want to become pregnant. So thanks to all my aspirants for being with me in this lecture. Please study hard. Any help you want, you can contact me. My number is there. My website is there where I am available for 24 hours in chat box. You have the email also. You can come to me and you can watch out various video regarding your need preparation, both in terms of your study aspects or your preparation aspects. There is a playlist you can go through and watch. So friend, please take care. See you soon with the another lecture.